Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, councillors, officers and public. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Corporate Scrutiny Committee meeting for Tamworth Borough Council on the 1st of February 2022. Um, we have apologies, the first being from the Chair of the Committee, uh, Councillor Thomas Jay, who has been unable to make this evening's meeting and hence I am set in his place. Do we have any other apologies? I don't believe we do, we have a full house. Thank you. Moving on, we have minutes of the previous meeting held on the 18th of November 2021. They are for approval. You've, you've all received them, you've all looked at them. Happy to move them, Chairman, if that helps. Councillor People, do we have a seconder? Um, <laughs> thank you, Simon. Second. Yeah, so. mm. Can we have a vote of hands that we're all in agreement? Thank you very much. Unanimous. Um, declarations of interest. Can I ask, are there any interests to be declared this evening? Thank you very much. The silence says no. Uh, Update from the Chair, just to remind members that a written update had been circulated regarding the request for further information on returns on investments and also to remind members that there is an all councillor training session scheduled for Wednesday the 9th of February 2022. It's on Teams uh, and it's been organised by Stephen Garner and will be delivered by the Council's Treasury Management Consultants, Link Asset Services. Um, just to remind members that the 9th of December meeting was cancelled and that was because reports that were expected had not been delivered. Um, so hence there are some reports that we find on tonight's agenda. Uh, are there any other items from anybody? Move on then to item five. These are responses to reports of the Corporate Scrutiny Committee. Uh, at the November committee meeting, the quarter two uh, performance review was considered and the committee's comments were recorded in the updated report, which was received by Cabinet on the 2nd of December. Anybody have any comments to make? Anything coming back? from that report. Thank you very much. Item number six, consideration of matters referred to the Corporate Scrutiny Committee from Cabinet or Council. At the moment we have nothing recorded. Item number seven, the forward plan. This item is to consider whether there are any further items on the forward plan which this committee would like to consider. The possible items will include the Staffordshire Leaders Board uh, and there's a Cabinet decision due the 17th of February 2022 uh, and there's uh, an email being, uh, being sent out by Andrew Barrett, uh, this is about the Staffordshire Leaders Board. It's been an informal arrangement amongst the Staffordshire Leaders. Uh, this is a proposal that just makes it a more formal and structured uh, meeting. Um, release of capital contingency, uh, a cabinet decision due the 17th of February 2022. Councillor People. Thank you, Chair. Um, apologies. I think with regard to the forward plan, that's the one that's published by the Council, and at the moment there's only one new item on it that wasn't previously on it, um, which we then usually take as a possible item to add to the uh, committee's work plan later in the meeting. Um, and I was mindful of what you said about the um, Leaders Board, 
the the one new item on the floor plan is the council housing rent accreditation uh, i presume that will be going to the new housing and homelessness prevention board um, so i didn't think there was anything on the forward plan to take forward to consideration for the work plan but i would suggest that you're right to highlight the leaders board because with the devolution bid that's in the offing the leaders board would become more of a discursive area that might involve which bids to go for which areas of devolution to pursue as priority over others so um, when we come to discuss the forward plan i would appreciate you taking up your point that that should be considered thank you thank you council people Joe, we'll add that to uh, comments thank you very much um, talked about release capital contingency uh, and then there is new vision and corporate plan 2022 to 2025 again cabinet decision is due the 17th of March 2020 is everybody comfortable anybody any questions thank you very much um, item 8 is reset and recovery and it's for me to invite the assistant director of neighborhoods Tina Mustafa to provide a brief overview of the work stream allocation between the scrutiny committees uh, I believe this is the first opportunity this committee has had to review any details on work streams and to consider the level of detail it would like to receive Tina Thank you, Chairman, for that introduction and good evening, councillors. Thank you for inviting us to talk about the Council's recovery and reset programme and agenda. Um, as you quite rightly say, because this is the first opportunity corporate scrutiny have had to look at the programme as a whole, we've prepared um, a few slides for you to give you an overview of not only the programme, but then in particular the service redesign project and the finance and commerciality project. And Lynn's joining me tonight to help showcase the highlight reports that you've already had as part of your pack. Um, so if, if you sort of want to bear with us in, t in terms of that. Just before we get into the um, presentation, I just want to introduce Rachel Walker. She's from Truman Change and she's been assisting us, or their company have been assisting us with the programme infrastructure in terms of the, you know, the levels of document control, the highlight reports and trying to build um, capacity uh, within our teams to be able to manage the programme from when it was uh, inception right the way through. So do you just want to say hi, Rachel? Good evening. Thank you very much for having me along. Um, I've been down working with Tina, so I thought we'd pop along to this evening's meeting. Um, yes, I'm from Truman Change. We provide programme and project management for recovery and reset. Um, so although Tina is our programme director, um, it's my, myself and colleagues that support the assistant directors with their various projects. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so, yes, we thought we'd invite Rachel. We do usually um, work with Truman via Teams because that's the most efficient way, but obviously it was an opportunity for put a face to a name, as it were. Um, so, yes, very quickly tonight we're going to run through just a recap around the recovery and reset aims, what we're trying to achieve. There's been three cabinet papers since we started, um, one back in... October 2020 which set out the programme framework and you know how we had largely um, responded to the pandemic and what some of our transitional um, recovery and reset agenda items were going to be so um, it's just a refresh of what we of what that original sort of framework was looking at um, I then just want to share with you the visual around that scrutiny and recovery and reset board oversight um, that we've already shared with the chairs and which will, sh which will show you which sort of project within the programme sits where. We then are very quickly just going to um, showcase the programme summary. We're not going to go through that in any detail because obviously the relevant um, other scrutiny committees have had oversight of those particular projects, um, although as I say, Lynn and I will cover the service redesign stuff tonight. Um, I'm then going to sh share with you the programme timeline uh, which will help inform your work plan, I think, going forward in terms of what you might want to see back at this committee and when. 
Um, the programme risks, I'm just going to share with you the, the temperature map, um, although audit and governance are going to look at that in more detail in March following a, an internal audit assurance assessment around recovery and reset um, arrangements anyway. But I can share with you how we capture some of that. Um, and then obviously Lynn and I will pick up our own highlight reports and then we'll just finish off with what are some of the things coming up in the next few weeks or months um, which will focus your attention. So if we just focus, look on the programme aims, uh, Rachel's going to draw you for me. Um, so if you remember from some of the Cabinet um, papers, the the Recovery and Reset Transformation pro transformation Programme was broadly aimed at achieving some of these things. So it was largely about increasing our financial resilience across the organisation to reduce that funding gap within the general fund. It was about continuing to deliver our core and statutory services. It was about enhancing the uh, citizen experience through an acceleration of our digital and e-enabled services so they're more evidence-based. Um, it was about collaborating with the voluntary sector and harnessing what has become a formidable presence of our anchor organisations that we've seen during the pandemic. It was about ensuring that our ambitions corporately around regeneration and play shaping continue to stimulate growth and inward investment into Tamworth. Um, clearly it's about reducing our carbon footprint in line with our own ambitions and many of you will have been at the front end of that. Um, and, and, and understand that, and then obviously celebrating our heritage and our assets. Um, so under each of those things, we, we, we have just put one or two headlines where we're using this programme to contribute to the delivery of those aims. So far, um, in terms of the Cabinet and full council papers that went last July and were approved at full council on the 25th of August, that already... Uh, reported a package of around three and a half million of savings by decommissioning Marmion and by working smarter and you know modernising our practices in terms of service delivery and then you'll hear a bit later in terms of the service redesign framework there's an opportunity to achieve a further three million uh, across that programme so you know in terms of fulfilling that key um, driver we were already making head roads into that but what i would say is it requires delivery and implementation that's not done and achieved we're still very much in the process of delivery around that and then of course across every one of the other areas what i would say is the program is incredibly interdependent that's why it's a program and not a series of projects <coughs> excuse me and we could probably put every project in every one of those aims um, but certainly there's some examples there and, and particularly around celebrating our heritage I just want to point out that we said in the cabinet paper back in um, in July and at full council in August that our town hall would become our municipal headquarters that sits outside of the corporate um, outside of the recovery and reset uh, program and is managed separately as a corporate project but still obviously uh, is interlinked with some of those aims thank you so if we go back to that sort of cr scrutiny and board oversight, um, through the Recovery and Reset Board, which meets bi-monthly, and that comprises Cabinet colleagues and members of our executive and leadership team, um, it was agreed that we would discuss with scrutiny chairs what would be the most effective way to uh, you know, influence and inform the programme's progress and development. So this was the proposal put forward and that has subsequently been agreed by the respective scrutiny chairs and it basically is, is as it says there. So um, we already attended um, infrastructure safety and growth on the 19th of January and uh, Paul Weston and Anna Miller attended to talk about building utilisation and economic recovery and regeneration for the programme. Um, and it's fair to say that that stimulated a lot of discussion um, and scrutiny and comments will go forward to inform our cabinet reporting and development. Uh, again, last week, uh, the 25th of January, uh, colleagues attended the health and wellbeing scrutiny. Uh, Zoe Waliki and her team um, updated on smart working and the customer services offer. And Joe Sands, who I know you know, attended to talk about the third sector and vulnerability. So again, that's why we're not going to cover those uh, projects in detail tonight, because they've already had that requisite scrutiny. Um, but then corporate scrutiny was to have that overall programme 
uh, overview and in particular look at finance and service redesign and it's feeling so far like they were the right homes for those projects because they tend to interlink uh, specifically as well as generally across the program um, but we have said that once when we've been um, with yourselves tonight we will meet again with all the scrutiny chairs to see if there's anything else we can improve upon that process um, and then audit and governance um, we are we are intending to go along in March to update on the approach to risk management um, and um, that is also going to follow a internal audit to look at assurance across the program infrastructure which will feed in. So we have got some highlights to share with you tonight very briefly, but again audit and governance will pick that up. So that's in terms of why we're here tonight and what we're going to be talking to you about. So if we look at the um, program summary, this is a very busy slide and we're not going to sort of dip into every highlight report because as I say that side it's in individual uh, scrutiny from the requisite um, committees but basically what this does and we share it every month at our corporate project team in terms of um, the meetings that we have as a, as a, as a, uh, a program team along with Truman Change uh, facilitating that and we go through every project so as you can see all the, s the seven projects are down the left left hand side the lead officers or the ADs are all listed there and we give it an overall uh, rag rating in terms of progress and that follows those standard conventions so green is it's on track amber is where we want to flag a particular risk red is where there is um, uh, a real risk in terms of that scoring matrix in terms of deliverability and purple is where they are interdependent which means they rely on other things so at this point from a program point of view what I would say to you is um, the program is on track all the risks are being managed there are the relevant mitigations in place um, and probably the biggest risks are around um, the regeneration in terms of Marmion House and some of that commercial viability coming forward but consultants are working with us on that um, we are focused on the play shaping and the wider outcomes around that but clearly that's driven by some of the market intelligence and the appetite um, out there to do that so that's not to say that that project isn't on track they are all being progressed as they should be um, but a consequence of that could be that we have to look at a wider scope in terms of some of the options uh, for Marmion and then of course you know in terms of some of the service redesign which we're going to talk about later and and Lynn's financial management and commerciality some of those are entirely dependent on being delivered um, in the sense of we have got potential efficiencies through the repurposing of budgets we can achieve which have been built into the medium term financial forecast and plan but they require delivery so at best they are an opportunity and a potential uh, rather than an actual uh, delivery at this stage. Um, so that just gives you a summary. We can share this with you. I know elsewhere on the agenda tonight is the quarter three performance reports where you've also got the highlight reports. Um, but we can share that slide with you and you'll be able to uh, zoom into any one of those highlight reports and look at some of that detail uh, at your leisure and happy to take you know, any questions offline or at future meetings. So just in terms of the programme timeline, I just wanted to recap on some of the, uh, the you know, on the current decisions. So as I've said, full uh, council on the 25th of August uh, last year approved the decommissioning of Marmion House. Um, and that was predicated on a business case that means, and now savings around that were built into the medium term financial plan, means we would have to be moving out of Marmion House by April to June. 2023 so you know just over 12 months from now um, if that's delayed uh, or changed then that that means the business case would need to be adjusted because that three and a half million of package of savings I mentioned earlier um, around a million of that is revenue savings by being able to make savings on the continued running of this building so that was around the decommissioning of Marmion there's also timelines in there to explore the regeneration and the options for Marmion House. We're currently doing a constraints study at the moment and a commercial and viability assessment um, to look at what those options are for this for this site. Um, 
the other recommendations were to agree our customer service and reception arrangements in the town um, and some of the, you know, it, it won't do justice at all, we could spend all night talking about this, but some of the principles and the drivers for that are that we would have a co-located co back office and town centre reception um, opening on, you know, more of conventional hours in terms of uh, unbooked appointments, etc. And we're currently working on the data and the evidence to support mm -hmm. that to go forward into Cabinet decisions planned in April. Um, also, those recommendations last year were to source rental accommodation in the town to, to you know, for our new home, as it were, in terms of that back office and that reception. Um, and uh, we've just appointed a negotiator uh, to start working with landlords across the town to have those discussions. But obviously, at this stage, we need to protect the council's commercial interest um, and are not able to divulge those premises at this stage, although we have said at future meetings we could have things in a confidential session where we can explore that in more detail. And then clearly we want to work collaboratively with the voluntary sector so that our vulnerability definition and strategy is hand in glove with our customer services offer and looks to reach out to those people who you know, are vulnerable and who we can work with partners to develop that service offer. So that broad timeline, it says, you know, we're here in that little dot there. You know, we're working towards uh, a, cabinet rep uh, a cabinet paper on that's now on the forward plan for the 7th of April to progress all those decisions so that on the 7th of April there will be clear recommendations to cabinet uh, about where we're going, what that customer services offer looks like, what the plan is for this building, you know, in terms of security, the, the idea being as we move out between April and June next year, there are arrangements in place for either the security or the demolition of this um, to complement whatever is the future regeneration ambitions. Um, so that timeline is very broad. There are individual timelines for every project and we literally couldn't get them all on one page. So that just gives you that sort of programme overview. So if we want to go to um, the service redesign uh, highlight report now, if we may. Um, so obviously this service redesign was one of the projects within the programme. It's basically got three phases to it. And again, that this is in your pack, so you, you, you can look at this uh, at your leisure as well. Uh, but those three phases, the first phase was... Uh, was was sort of 2021 to 2022, uh, which looked at financial resilience and financial sustainability. Um, so the idea was that there was, from a baseline assessment that we did last year, there was opportunities across all of our uh, organisation and services where we could look at more efficient ways of delivering things. And that, that was the long list that's already been shared with, with colleagues. And there's an update plan to our executive leadership team and the recovery and reset board in February to talk about whether those um, those areas can you know can still go forward to deliver some of that financial sustainability and resilience and some of that targeted saving has been built into the medium term financial plan that was reported to cabinet on the 20th of January. Um, the second phase, which was 2022 to 2023, was to develop some targeted service reviews that would not only look at a refresh of service standards across the organisation linked to reducing waste demand, um, but also would look at some of those services that through the baseline assessment um, presented themselves as more contained areas that we could look at different service delivery opportunities. And they include things like our corporate antisocial behaviour um, approach, particularly the community wardens and CCTV, looking at our partnership resourcing around education, some of our audit and treasury management arrangements, and then also um, some opportunities around revs and, uh, revenues and benefits, which you know, Lynn has already been progressing. Um, so there is a paper going, as I say, to the board and to the executive leadership team about how we can move that forward, because um, that some of those uh, opportunities have been built into the MTFS and we need to be able to understand whether there's a realistic prospect of delivery of those. And then from 2023 onwards, 
initially from the baseline assessment, the view was that we would have a root and branch service review right across the organisation covering every team. And there was almost like a five year plan from that point onwards. Um, the narrative slightly changed around that now because the view is from our executive leadership team that we would do a horizon scan or we would do a strategic assessment across the economic, social, technical landscape to see where we are and what our financial picture looks like. Um, because as you know, again, Lynn will talk about this later, um, we did only have a one-year settlement. There's still financial uncertainty in terms of fair funding review and it might well be, for example, that by 2023-24, you know, how our landscape is different and we can then respond to that accordingly, recognising that by, def by definition recovery and reset is transitional and transformational um, and there might need to be a different approach at that point. Um, so the focus for the next 12 months is going to be on delivering that financial uh, resilience and on delivering outcomes through the usual governance and decision making structures, those targeted service reviews. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Lena who's going to talk about her project and then I'm just going to finish off with a few dates for your uh, diary and for your work plan at the end, if that's okay, Chairman. Thank you. Tina, I'd, I'd like to say thank you very much for your report, very in-depth and very comprehensive. Uh, and obviously now I'd like to hand over to uh, Lynn Pugh, who's our Assistant Dir Director of Finance, for her support and backup on this report. Lean over to you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tina. Um, the finance work streams um, project has five key work streams to it, but our focus has primarily in this last month or so been on the first work stream, which is around about reducing the deficit for 9.3 million that was reported to Cabinet in December to a position where we have a balanced budget. Um, since we sent the report to Cabinet in December, we have received our draft initial local government financial settlement figures, and we've now built these into the medium-term financial strategy. Um, as Tina alluded to, we had early indications that we were likely to receive figures for three years. Unfortunately, the settlement figures that we received from the government were actually only for one year. The main changes that came through in that settlement figures were that they actually decided to continue with the revenue support grant which amounted about £200,000 to us, and the lower tier grant, which was another £100,000 to us as a council, introduced a new one-off services grant of 160000 to us, and actually extended the new homes bonus scheme, which for the last three or four years, I think they've said they're going to uh, terminate, and gave us another £700,000 worth of funding through that scheme. Also, due to the delays in the business rates reform, we've actually um, managed to keep growth of about a million pounds. So those changes that came through from the local government financial settlement figures actually produced an extra 2.2 million pounds for us, but only for 2022-23. Added to which then we've identified approximately 2.9 million pounds worth of savings over five years through phase one of the recovery and reset program, which Tina has just outlined to you. We do have still a significant number of uncertainties in our budgets. There is the government funding levels for future years, pending all their planned reforms, which have been deferred year on year for a couple of years now. Um, we have not agreed to pay a deal with staff yet, and the unions are out to ballot at the moment. Uh, we have further uncertainty over what the future interest rate levels will be and their impact on our investment income and our treasury management strategy. There are also likely to be price rises for the council through energy supplies and building supplies. We're expecting to see um, significant future costs across all of our profit portfolios for profit property portfolios, sorry, for energy efficiency costs and we experience an increase in the costs of repairs at the moment. Um, the income from our con commercial and industrial portfolio has held up during the pandemic, but the underlying market issues and the increase in online shopping, it's not known at present if this will have a significant impact on our loss income in the future. The other areas of the work stream, sadly, have been 
um, slightly less in our focus over the last month because we've been concentrating on the budget. But we do have commercial commerciality strategy in the action plan. There are drafts written which we've reviewed with the aim to help us develop a culture that embraces a more business-like approach and a way of operating and ensure our staff are equipped with the right skills and help us to adopt some of the positive behaviours that are associated with commercial organisations. The third one is to improve training and understanding of the Council's budgets. Um, we are in the process of introducing some face-to-face -face procurement training for all budget holders. Our aim was to deliver this in February, however, because of the increased COVID restrictions introduced just before Christmas, this means there'll be a slight delay on this, so it's more likely to be end of February, early March before we do that one. But that will link nicely into developing our value for money strategy looking at reducing waste across all services and looking at how our operating costs are accumulated, looking at our methods of service delivery and our operating models to ensure that we always try to make the most effective use of resources. And finally, we've got a review of fees and charges, which we've included an amount of £40,000 to be recovered from additional planning fees following a review of current fees set by officers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Lynn, for your report and your attendance. Um, gentlemen, ladies, uh, sorry, the ladies won't ask questions. Uh, not because they don't want to, it's because they can't. Uh, they're officers of the council, my apologies. Um, gentlemen, do you have any questions coming from that report, both reports, comprehensive as they are? Uh, Councillor Goodall, f first. Thanks, Chair. Um, it was mentioned about sort of energy pressures um, that could be sort of a problem moving forward. But is is that really significant with Marmion House closing and maybe a more energy efficient building going forward after that? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Goodall. So. I think in terms of that sort of reduction in terms of that carbon footprint, it was just recognising that that's, you know, one of the council's key, um, you know, key objectives. So, you know, it's a, a consideration in all our development and place shaping proposals. I think what we talked about uh, infrastructure safety and growth, if you remember, is if our negotiations are to rent in the town centre, then clearly that's got to be proportionate, that level of investment has got to be proportionate to what you know, any lease, subsequent lease looks like in, in terms of that. Um, but certainly in terms of um, those uh, ambitions, they'll be considered as part of that overall decision making. I mean, just on that next steps on that very last slide, I will leave that up there, uh, if I may, um, because that does sort of put dates in your diary in terms of what's coming next. So all the scrutiny committees are listed there and there is an intention to go back to Cabinet on the 7th of April, that's now on the forward plan, to take forward some of those decisions and we'll be doing a community impact assessment covering some of those things that you've mentioned, Councillor Goodall, amongst the usual equality impact assessment um, in areas. Um, but yeah, that's certainly on there. Thank you. Councillor People. Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of points. First of all, can I go back to the uh, mention that you made of, Tina, of the um, new building and the stats about appointments and things? Because as I understood it, one of the things that came out of the smart working, um, home working that we were forced to do was that we were actually able to monitor more closely when queries came in and that they were coming in at non-standard times because they tended to come in when people had finished work themselves or whatever. Um, are you saying that the proposal is to go back to having a central hut, yeah, let's call it the, the office if you like, um, and the appointment times would be going back to the previous regime of, you know, sort of nine to five? Thank you, Councillor People, for that question. I mean, that was addressed by colleagues um, uh, that, that particular question was addressed by colleagues at um, Health and Wellbeing scrutiny in some detail as we talked about our customer services offer. I think there are two elements to it. One is, um, you know, the council's ambition is to have e-enabled services and to accelerate our digital platforms. 
the political steer um, and obviously no decisions have been made around this yet but the political steer which we're working on the business case and the evidence and the intelligence to support the cabinet report on the 7th of April is to have conventional uh, office opening hours in the town so there wouldn't be booked appointments it would be open on those traditional hours um, whilst we continue to gather that baseline intelligence to so, move forward. So your that. answer is yes we're going to go yes. back to how we were before COVID? Well, well not quite because I, I think you know it, it is about recognising that that's the political steer as we um, look to relocate from this building next year but I think what the pandemic has clearly seen and accelerated is you know a citizen um, expectation if not a requirement that we do have those high volume low value tra transactions digitalized so you know it would be a missed opportunity we believe if it simply went back to where it was before um, but it but sounds like that's exactly what but you're planning but, but certainly the political steer at this stage is to you know certainly in that first period is to have those conventional uh, is to have those conventional hours of business so yes Thank you. That Zoe wanted to come in to add to what Tina had said, and I was looking for you to decide which uh, came first. No, in, indeed, Councillor People, and I had I had seen, and I was just about to invite Zoe to speak. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor <coughs> People. I think one of the key drivers for us has also been about um, our vulnerable customers, and that's the set of data that we're not sure that we haven't missed people, but we're not sure that we have. So it's if you can say we we don't know, we don't think so. You've heard a lot of data over the uh, the time that we um, haven't had any complaints, um, any formal complaints from um, cu customers to say that about the uh, mummy and house not being open. We've been working very very closely with CIC together, um, and working very collaborative. Um, colleagues who um, were at um, Health and Wellbeing last week, we did uh, we talked a lot around the vulnerable our vulnerable customers. But I think the key driver really is to make sure that we're not missing those customers whilst we're actually collecting that data to see what the true demand and having the ambition for the future for us to have maybe a reduced face-to-face -face service in line with the customer demands but we're sure about what that demand is the pandemic has been so different we don't want to kind of jump the gun and make those decisions prior to us actually going into um, normal times thank you if i may chair the the question i was posing was less about the vulnerable because actually there's traditionally been an issue that they are available more often in the day. Um, my concern was more with those who are at work and others and their ability to access appointments with staff, bearing in mind that, you know, if they're juggling school and work, um, that's why I'm asking about daytime. It, it, it's just making sure we've learned what we can as we go forward. And although you said we were working very closely with CIC, I seem to recall that they raised with the leader of the council why there was no notice on the front door saying that you know we had a, a service available in the assembly room so i think you know we need to make sure we actually patch it up really well um as we go back but that that's that's point now at least i know where the thinking's going chair thank you simon well, let's not be formal uh, yeah um I, I take the point about people who are working and I was under the impression that our staff were offering extended hours because of the way they were working currently. Is that not the case? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, we are offering um, some digital services um, to uh, m mainly for the repairs call centre um, from 8 in the morning till 6 at night. Um, and we are looking as part of the customer offer for it to be more digital because that's where we've seen that the demand is for those out of hours times. It's not it's not the front door. The demand is more on um, our web chat, which has exponentially risen through the pandemic from um, to uh, getting on for a thousand a month sometimes, depending on through the key bit of the pandemic. That's the bit of our service that really did increase. Emails has increased as well. Telephone interactions remains about 5,000 a month. 
um, and we haven't the face to face as we know we haven't had. So that whilst the telephones remain steady, that where we've seen the increases is in um, emails under web chat. Thank you, Zoe. Anybody else? Any questions? Simon? Uh, thank you. Stephen. <laughs> uh, the, um, the one point I would be grateful if um, Lynn could just clarify. You mentioned right at the beginning of your statement that we got some extra finances and we'd move from nine million deficit to a balanced budget. But as I understand it, actually what we've moved to is a balanced budget in year one and we've still got a lower deficit then at the end of year five. But the balance isn't against the nine million five year budget, it's against the short term. Um, I believe that's correct. I don't think anybody said the five year budget was balanced and no, if, if we have a 9.3 deficit, um, 2.9 uh, or 5.1 is not going to balance that. So I, I'm fairly certain there's a lot of work to continue to be done. Chair, I was only distinguishing between the short and the long term, yeah. which were, it, it, the comparison was made and I was just yeah. making it clear. Okay. Um, the Any further questions? If I could just... C get, certainly, Lynn. If I could just go back to Simon, yes, sorry. We've actually got a 4.4 million deficit over five years, but we are balanced over three years. Thank you. That, that was the clarity I wanted to share because I think um, there's been picked up by colleagues at other meetings of um, members saying, yeah, but it's not about the money. And obviously, to a certain extent, <laughs> it's always got to be about the money if you struggle, if, if you haven't got a balanced budget. So I just wanted to bring that, that point out without um, adding to it. But thank you for the opportunity. Anybody else, councillors? Councillor People. Thank you, Steve. Um, with regard to our income from properties, uh, Lynn very kindly said that at the moment it's been holding up, but obviously we're not sure about the market situation going forward. I presume that means the industrial units and other properties we actually own. Um, how far at the moment have we been, if you like, kept afloat by the fact that the government have made up the deficit and therefore we've been given that ability to keep moving? But at the same time now, obviously, we're going to find out whether businesses really can um, cope or, or which businesses want to carry on coping, because that does seem to be a, the question mark now, which ones have been hit by the pandemic and the changes in buying habits and so on. If I may, Chair. Um, I do happen to have the Assistant Director of Assets sat next to me, <laughs> who actually... Um, is uh, responsible for all our commercial and industrial units. At the moment, we haven't seen a significant slump or decline in any of the units being handed back or anything like that. Fingers crossed we seem to have weathered it at the moment. Thank you. That's really reassuring. I, I directed the question to you because you had done the report and it's your privilege to then decide whether someone else picked it up. Thank you, Chair. have to say, Lynn, that's some excellent news as well. Thank you. Gentlemen, any further questions, please? Uh, that being the case, are there any recommendations from this committee uh, to go forward uh, for Cabinet? I, I, Council of People. Chair, uh, having had the privilege of sitting on two of the other audit committee uh, scrutiny committees and the audit committee subcommittee the other night with some of the other members here I think my suggestion would be that we draw attention to the detailed comments that have already been made by those scrutiny committees who've gone into different areas um, in depth and obviously I wasn't at health and well-being but clearly they did as well so I think if we could just reinforce the message that those detailed comments should be addressed because thought has gone into them and would in inform cabinet in looking at the way forward thank you uh, that being the case then um, i would like to thank our officers for attending they've been extremely comprehensive in the reports thank you very much uh, and if you'd like to make your escape those that wish to you are more than welcome to also uh, rachel rachel walker from uh, truman thank you for your attendance as well
Okay, thank, thank you very much, everybody. We'll now move on to item nine, which is the quarter three 2021-2022 performance report. Uh, it has been distributed. Um, the leader, unfortunately, is unable to attend to present it. So uh, if you wish, we can go through it. Uh, item one on it, I believe, we've just had extensive reports upon. Uh, if we go, that's reset recovery. Uh, item two is corporate projects. Anybody got anything they'd like to raise? Three is general fund. I'm taking silence as acceptance, by the way. Four is universal credit summaries. Five is, is the... <coughs> I've gone too far on the screen, excuse me. Five is the corporate plans and corporate risk register. Uh, Councillor People. Thank you, Chair. Um, we saw it highlighted in the last report and certainly at the subcommittee for the audit and governance the other night, a great deal of effort and thought has been had a look at these areas. Um, in particular, I think the issue that we're all very aware of is that as this council has a, a very large budget to do some major reworks, we've also hit a very large increase in costs um, and I'm sure with your professional background, you'd be more than <laughs> more able than many to give us an explanation of all that's going on. But I, I do think that was the essence of what came out was that, you know, most things are, are being managed, but it's just the unknowns. But that was the particular point about item five that came out of those meetings. Thank you, Councillor People. Yes, um, unfortunately, it would appear that uh, energy and everything else is being... Uh, it, has affected the costs of everything else so uh sorry joe it's do you mean by that things like manufacturing cement bricks and the energy used all, in all it? sorts yes yeah, yeah. That, I, I i just suddenly thought i'll ask you because you'll know yeah, yeah um okay um that that has been noted joe yeah um item six is re regeneration project updates Chair, if I may. Not yet. Let me let me tell people what it's about. <laughs> but I thought they'd all memorised it, Chair. That's why they weren't asking you any questions. Uh, Solway uh, and future high street funds. Cancel people. Thank you, Steve. Um, Solway, Chair, I'm really glad to see that we've got this report coming back now because there was a genuine effort to have a look at a project with an arm's length company you know worth exploring but i think we were told that officer um, capacity to guide the consultants was an issue it's now gone on the markets move surprise surprise um you know as they do over two or three years um so i'm really pleased to see this coming back um because i think it does need revisiting there's a lot of money tied up in that arm's length company, which is fine. I'm not objecting to the principle, but I think if you've got a lot of money parked in a corner and you don't revisit it regularly, then it would be mistaken. And I think this now is a really crucial point where we might need to relook at what that's for. So um, I think that'd be particularly important. And um, I'm sure as a councillor in Mercy and Ward, anybody who's a councillor in Mercy and Ward will be wanting to know what we could or couldn't do with that money. So. Um, I think that that's a really important report to come in March. Um, with regard to the um, Future High Street Fund, um, I noticed that we're still negotiating for vacant possession of middle entry, so um, I, I'll be guided by you, Chair, um, as to whether it was appropriate to ask the officer to respond privately to the members as opposed to in a public meeting if there's commercial issues at stake. But given that we aren't yet in possession of the co-op and we haven't yet got permission to, to own middle entry, I think it's an area that we're good to explore. Indeed, councillor people. However, 
commercial sensitivity, I think that is something that we would take offline uh, and private response as required. Well, is that agreed as a, an action for tonight then, Chair, that we would be updated on the, the issue by confidential email? Um, can I ask the officers? Chair, if I may on that one. It actually sits with Anna Miller uh, the, on the regen side for that particular project, so it wouldn't be myself on that one. So. It's fine, Chair. I'm just saying if you as Chair say that that will happen, I'm sure it will. And that being the case, Councillor People, we can make a request for information and we can request that that's sent out privately uh, uh, and confidentially. Um, moving on, we have Gungate, Amington Local Centre. If I may. Yes, Councillor People. Um, can I ask how far we are on now with deciding about the marketing of this? Because this was raised a couple of reports ago as to we were looking at what to do with that centre. Um, and in fact, the leader, I think, on that night got confused between that and the one at the carrier. So I'm assuming that since then something's happened um, or that have, can we have some update if that's possible? Uh, if I can refer to the officers. Again, Chair, that's, that one sits with the Regen project, so that's Regen board, so that'll be uh, Anna Miller's team. That being the case, then I think we need to have a word with Anna Miller's team and identify where we are, what's going on and when it's going to happen. Is that okay? Absolutely, Chair. I, to be honest, I'm a bit surprised that Amington counts as regen. I could understand that Middle Entry did, <laughs> but, but I, I'm, I'm beginning to think this, uh, you know, but, but that's fine. I mean, if you're, if you're happy that we get the information, then uh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, moving on through this report, and it is quite a lengthy one, ladies and gentlemen. We have the impact of welfare benefit reform on council services all the associated I'm, go I'm going through universal credit we've seen the numbers medium term financial strategy we've just had a discussion on that uh, Dated forecasts, I, th I believe Lynn has already covered that as well. Housing revenue accounts. Recovery and reset program, again, that's been discussed at great length earlier on. General fund finance. We're aware of any shortcomings, I believe. Housing revenue account. Please shout up if you want to raise questions on any of the following. Financial health check, general fund and revenues. HR capital. Uh, we then have our net zero carbon uh, project highlight report. Chair, yeah. can I ask, i um, been invited to a meeting next week, I think it is, um, on this. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask, it, it says here appointment consultant, presumably now that that's done because we're meeting with them. Um, and it says cabinet stroke ISAG for follow up. Does that mean it'll be ISAG committee that will be in future reviewing it? I, I believe the intention is to put it through the ISAG committee, yeah. Okay. Uh, town centre program. Um, I can't say there's an awful lot uh, that I can report on because I'm not totally familiar with it. Uh, but as you go through the report, you will see highlighted that there are a number of uh, points that have been completed and achieved. Uh, and as far as I can see, only one yet uh, that remains incomplete. Uh, 
uh, welfare reform. Corporate capital strategy. I'm so pleased you guys are well on top of all this information. Councillor people. Thank you. Um, with regard to the money that we've got invested with the um, property funds, um, have we got any figures on how much of their fund is not invested in property? Because as I understand the prospectus, they're allowed to invest in government bonds and other financial instruments. So I just wondered how much they're in. If it, I, I wouldn't expect it necessarily to be available now. Happy to receive it offline, Chair. But I, I did raise it previously, so I would like to know whether they are investing in property or, or because mm -hmm. that the level of risk that we perceive depends yeah. a bit on what we. You know, if somebody said they were investing in in the 430 at Newmarket, we'd all feel it was risky. Where, whereas if you invest in property, there's a sense of it must be safe. So mm -hmm. when I found out that yeah. you can actually invest this money in different things, I thought it'd be nice to know, well, actually, how much property, yeah. how much is in bonds, and how much is in derivatives. Thank well, you. Yeah, well, well to, be, to be honest, Councillor, I believe February the 9th, there is a training session with our investment partners, uh, and we can ask all of those questions. I would strongly recommend everybody attend that. Uh, I do know I, I asked questions a while ago with regards to investments and returns um, and it's maybe something that we can get a little bit of an answer from later when we speak to the portfolio holder this evening. Okay. Moving on. Uh, the organisational development strategy. Everything appears to be flowing through. Leisure strategy. Corporate risk summary. Uh, finance financial stability to ensure the council is financially sustainable as an organization uh, that obviously is under uh, a work remit already so thank you Lynn uh, Avoid bad risk, avoid bad practices, uh, risk headings. Again, I believe all this is being looked at. General fund main variances. Uh, and that, I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, takes us through to the end of that report unless anybody has any other questions on that report. That being the case I would request that we have a mover and a seconder to approve the report that we've received. Happy to move for acceptance of the report Chair. Can Councillor People thank you. Seconder, please. Councillor Cooper. Chair, I do have my uses. <laughs> Nobody has ever said anything different, Councillor. Councillor Cooper seconds. Thank you. Um, can we have a, a vote, please, by show of hands? All those in favour? That's a unanimous decision. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on. Item 10. Post implementation review, my Tamworth portal. Ah, Lynn, you're, le you're leaving us. Thank you very much for your attendance and your support. Um, we have with us this evening portfolio holder for finance and customer services, Councillor Marie Bailey, as well as 
the assistant director uh, people, Zoe Welicky, and Ali Millard, who is head of customer experience. Uh, a report has been made available, uh, and I will hand over to the portfolio holder to go through that report for us. Councillor Bailey, thank you very much for your attendance. Over to you. Thank you. Um, what I'm actually going to do is hand it over to Zoe, who will go through and give you all an update on where we are with the My Portal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Chair. So the purpose of the report we're bringing tonight is to inform the committee on our current position with our My Tamworth customer portal and give you a review of the costs, difficulties encountered, outcomes to date and the future project plan for uh, um, going forward. So this has been a very long um, project and it hasn't come without um, some distinct difficulties. Back in early 2018, we undertook a procurement exercise to seek a supplier who could provide us with a customer relationship management system along with a self-service customer portal. We uh, went through a tender exercise and in May 2018, Civica were successful in their bid. Civica is one of the UK's largest software um, companies with over 30 years experience working with public services. As I said earlier, we haven't been without um, difficulties and um, the team has often needed to replan and refocus. Um, none more so the challenges because of the um, work that uh, the teams were undergoing as a, um, the council's response to the pandemic. They're the key teams that have been delivering the front-facing services um, such as revs, uh, revenues and benefits and also the customer service team. So the original requirement of the project was to de um, deliver six key things which included a housing application form, um, safeguarding processes, um, a complaints um, process online and um, adding and removing single person discount or also uh, when people move house within the borough. Um, in late 2018, Civica um, informed us that they were not able to deliver the housing application form. Our application form was um, 20 plus pages, quite complex and Civica were unable to um, deliver this for us. So we had to go a little bit back to the drawing board and do some negotiations with Civica in order to allow us to um, deliver other things. But we were able to deliver the housing application form through Orchard, um, which is our housing system for housing tenants. We um, purchased the portal with Orchard, which is called My Housing and um, started to develop that. And in September 2021, we went live with housing application forms. Since then, we have had um, 548 application forms received uh, since um, the end of September. So the team also encountered um, delays because of um, the intense work that was required in the development and um, the work that they were required to do for um, their day job, plus also the pandemic response. Um, it has been um, a very tricky project and um, one of the key things that was underestimated was by our provider in that they um, underestimated the amount of consultant days that was required. Um, Ali will be, and I'm going to introduce Ali shortly, but Ali will actually go through um, some of the key figures um, in a little while. So. Um, Despite the issues the teams have faced, phase one was delivered in January, which this includes complaint, uh, complaint reporting, moving home notifications, online reporting for street scene issues, and also viewing ta council tax accounts. Uh, work continues on phase two and will continue to update the committee as appropriate. So um, there's been many, many people involved in the project. I am now going to hand over to Ali, who will give you some details. So Ali joined us in um, August 2019. She's done a fantastic job of dr um, driving this project forward and um, supporting it to um, initial implementation. But she will also be supporting and driving forward our digital agenda, as we were talking about earlier. And we'll be, um, we've got a digital development plan, which I'm sure you'll hear more about in the future. So over to you, Ali. 
Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, councillors, for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you about this um, project. Um, so, as Zoe mentioned, the, this um, post-project review relates to the implementation of the delivery of the My Tamworth Customer Portal and the Digital 360 Customer, customer Relationship Management System, with the provider being Civica. So provision of a customer portal um, not only increases access to services but also empowers our customers to be able to manage their online account and also for them to be able to have visibility of the progress of any service requests they've submitted to us. The back office process of the uh, self-service platform links to the Digital 360 system which is designed to create a golden customer record from which we can develop our customer intelligence and make every contact count across all our access channels. The project has not been without its, gl its glitches, uh, which I will come on to, uh, but I would also like the opportunity to acknowledge that the project team have remained de dedicated to developing a quality pro project with um, efficient back office processes. Um, they've demonstrated a can-do attitude um, this led to us adopting a two-phased approach um, prior to launch um, and that was because the team were very keen to get the completed processes across the line to enable the customer to engage with them whilst we worked on other systems and processes that we weren't 100% happy with but which required extra resource from Civica for us to be able to complete them. <coughs> so. As is mentioned, um, in, as you can see in section two of the report, there have been many offices that have contri contributed to this project. And in section three, you can see the lead officers um, that will be looking to, um, that have conducted this review and will be looking to take the digital development plan forward. So in conducting the review, we've reflected upon the terms upon which the contract with Civica was awarded. And they were successful in their tender submission because they offered us a fixed price package to enable a self-service platform for essential housing and revenues processes. Furthermore, they committed to training our officers so that we could become self-sufficient in developing the uh, self-service platform for additional processes. They um, were skilled, became skilled in um, customer journey mapping, process building and reporting, which would give us um, self-sufficiency going forward in developing that, pro that product. They committed to all of this being delivered within a 40-day time frame. I do have to say that we are plus 200 days at the moment with this project at Civica's cost. Um, so the agreed project scope was um, detailed in, in section 5 of the report, which is to deliver a full portal package solution incorporating a corporate um, CRM duration of 40 days. Unfortunately, the workshops with Civica soon identified that they'd grossly underestimated the intricacy of some of our key processes, especially those that needed to be integrated with other systems across the organisation. We discovered that Civica could not meet their obligation um, for the crea creation of an online application form and a safeguarding reporting process without additional development costs, which were £12,000 just for the safeguarding process alone. Several contract meetings took place uh, with senior officers from Tamworth Borough Council and Civica to ensure that the, product that the product delivered was fit for purpose and covered some of our key processes and delivered the back office um, efficiencies that were required. So as a result, the project deliverables were renegotiated and these are summarised in the report in section six. Of course, the extended time frame means that we experienced many more challenges that would have been um, that we would have done in a 40-day turnaround. Um, the issues are listed in the report and include upgrades, changes in personnel, uh, changes in project officers, both at Tamworth Borough Council and within Civica. And I really would like to give a special mention um, to our much-loved colleague, Kirsty Horsnell, who became seriously ill during this project and passed away in February 2020. Kirsty was very dedicated to this project, and it's only just that she's recognised in this post-project implementation review. In the main, the delays in the launch of the portal have been as a result of dependency on additional um, Civica resource, which they'd not planned for. 
but wherever possible, the team have strived to progress the processes within our own control and with our own learning, such as the generic report it form. Regarding the knowledge transfer activities, we now have officers who've developed their skills to be able to process map, um, to um, journey map um, and build processes, create training videos and user guidance. Also, we've commenced demos of the system to service leads across the organisation and have in invited them to let us work with them to move their um, high volume processes over into the portal environment. We have a residual budget, budget of over £7,000 which will fund any external consultancy or development required to enable us to maximise the return on investment for this project. In terms of the transition to operations, um, the knowledge transfer is very successful, um, but we will now look to build resilience within the digital team and take a train-the-trainer approach to ensure that we've got more officers developing the digital skills that are required. And we'll also continue to work across the organisation in order to um, get as many processes onto the portal as possible and reach those efficiencies that we set out for origi originally. Um, there are some residual risks that we've um, detailed in section 9 of the report, but these have been identified and provided for in our forward digital development plan. Of course, it's essential that we monitor user satisfaction, and that means with the customers and also with um, the staff. So we will be making efforts to get feedback from customers and um, from the staff as to how the portal is working. In terms of lessons learned, yeah, we have experienced difficulties throughout the project that have been reliant on Civica to resolve. But in reflection, we have identified several learning opportunities for Tamworth Borough Council. Um, which we have set out in detail in section 11 of the report, but in summary, um, it's about testing the assumptions made by the contractor, the need to prioritise medium to long term in-house resource around other priority corporate um, activities such as council tax bill drop and at the time um, we were impacted on by the need to distribute very quickly the business grants um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, mitigating changes in personnel with the contractor um, to include introducing a formal process um, so that we can be assured of what new people being brought into the project can bring to it, what they can contribute to it. Um, on a positive note, it's clear that some of our officers have really flourished under the pressure of this project and have more or less become digital champions for Tamworth Borough Council. And we're confident that across the organisation there's an ambition and an appetite for digitised processes, which ultimately we hope will re release resource to be able to help customers who need a bit more help to engage with our services. The next steps for us, really, um, the launch of the portal is just a start. Um, it's the beginning of our journey and we've got an ambitious digital development plan, which we look forward to providing further updates on as we reach our milestones within that. Um, so the recommendations that we are seeking uh, that performance and development of the portal and its processes should be continually reviewed and reported on at six monthly intervals. The digital development plan should identify and implement enhancements to self-service processes with progress being reported via the corporate project highlight report structure and that the impact of the MyTamworth customer portal should be monitored to ensure that there's no detrimental impact to vulnerable service users, that services are easily accessed, and we will report this at six monthly intervals. I'd like to take the opportunity to provide you with a short presentation um, that gives a, a look and feel of the customer portal, um, but in the meantime, would we'll ask that the committee endorse the contents of the report and the recommendations within it. I'd just like to say thank you very much to our officers for the report and for supporting our meeting. Gentlemen, uh, councillors, do we have any questions to ask on, on the reports, please? Uh, Simon. Thanks, Chair. And thanks, officers, for the for the report. Um, just a comment, really. Um, it's it's good that we, we have been able to make some progress after perhaps a, a challenging start. And I think I'm... I'm quite encouraged, I guess, that um, we have done sort of a, a, a health check on on, on what the um, 
some of the issues have been and I guess it's it, it really comes down to perhaps that the, the tender process is, is perhaps not quite robust enough and and that we can we can sort of make some changes so these things perhaps don't happen happen in the future. So just that comment really. Thank you. Andy. Thanks, Chair. Um I think this this proves difficult reading for myself, if I'm gonna be honest. I think I'm going to be brutally honest, it comes across as a bit of a train wreck. And those that know me, but I don't like train wrecks. Um, I don't think the recommendations stack up against what the report is saying, if I'm brutally honest. I feel that um, there needs to be a very deep, hard look at how you tender out. If you, how you can take a project, not understand the the, the labour required for that project, project and give it to a company that doesn't have the resources in place to deliver the project, I don't understand how that can happen. I understand COVID, but I think that, I don't know, I think that might be a bit of an excuse. I might be a bit harsh, but I, the way I read it is it, it, it comes across as quite, quite bad. Um, there's something called the quality triangle when we're looking at um, projects, time, cost, quality. I'd, I'd love to know which one of those, because ultimately, if you don't have everything to meet the project's needs, one of those things falls over. So, obviously, we're, uh, we're either over time, uh, over cost, or under quality, and I'd like to understand which one of those it is. Uh, what are the risks with implementing this um, moving forward? Because, quite obviously, through the report, it hasn't been, it hasn't been put through, you know, right and are we going and as part of the recommendations can we please have something in there to look at our tendering process root and branch and understand what it is that we need and who out there can deliver it because we've gone to a company who have got a long history of working with um local governments sorry uh, it's a civica what's it is it 20 20 years of of working with us or other councils to de uh, deliver these things. I don't understand where the disconnect is between what the council wants and what they could deliver. And there is a huge disconnect there. Councillor Cooper, if I can interject, perhaps we'd the, the officers would like uh, an ish, an in, an in, put my teeth back in, an initial opportunity to respond, and then maybe it's something we might want to look at on a forward plan uh, at another time. But over to the officers. Thank you, Chair. Um, the issue very, very firmly sits with um, Civica, if I, um, I'll, I'll, I will be frank. Civica um, contracted with us to deliver what we asked them to deliver, the six deliverables within 40 days. The, they didn't meet that contractual um, obligation. They couldn't deliver the housing application form that they said they could deliver. So when they looked in, so um, the gross underestimation was from Civica when they um, quoted the 40 days, making a lot of assumptions. Um, the account manager, who we'd had for many years, we've used Civica products for many, many years, he doesn't work with Civica any longer. He was, um, because it was just so far away from what the promise was as to what they actually could deliver. And that was before, in, if truth be known, it was before the pandemic. Um, the pandemic has elongated how long it took us to get phase one in, but the actual, um, the key deliverables initially, this, uh, the two things that they couldn't do and, and literally said they couldn't do at all, safeguarding process and the housing application form. So it wasn't, it wasn't an underestimation from the procurement process because we had um, very, very um, detailed expectations of what we wanted out of the product. Um, and they said that they could do that within those 40 days. Um, but that's why Ali, when she's talking about the learning points is that maybe our learning point in the procurement process is to really push that, can you actually do that? Where's the evidence that you can actually do that for us? But it, it was with it, that was the process that there was just a massive underestimation of. And also the underestimation, there, there was a big assumption and everybody says never to assume that our staff knew the whole system inside and out. We were front-end users of it. 
with very few people, actually. So um, there was, uh, they wanted the product. They wanted us to buy the product from them, and um, they r really thought that we could do it within those days uh, initially. I don't believe they did it deliberately. It wasn't a deliberate act. It was mm -hmm. they thought they could deliver it for us in that, and it became very evident they couldn't. I, I personally had um, some quite difficult meetings with um, their senior management about the fact that you know you've signed on the um, you've signed to say that we can have a housing application form. They just they just couldn't do it. We were very lucky that Orchard could, and um, ja I must give Jane Wells um, um, a mention here. She has developed the Orchard portal and developed the housing application form. And as I said earlier, we're we're utilising that and looking at improved ways that we can use it that Ali and her team are, are working with. So yeah, it, it has been tricky and there's no two ways about it, but it was it was Civica's underestimation of the time that they were gonna take to do that, deliver us. Thank you, sir. Um, from my, uh, I've got you, so from, from my perspective, I would be asking why we need to go to a consultant to design a housing form when we have a number of councils, one particularly we work closely in partnership, why are we not uh, utilising their experiences and their forms if they have the right format? Uh, have we checked with the other councils that they've got something that, that could do for us or are we just reinventing a wheel? No, the, hou the housing application form is now sitting in an, our housing tenancy uh, management system. So it is the best way to do it because it talks to the rest of the tenancy management system. Um, we did explore various things when we knew that um, it couldn't be delivered, but this was, um, this was the best way to do it. When we initially um, tendered for the portal, Orchard hadn't developed in the way that they did in the, t um, the two years between the tender process and them being able to deliver that for us. Thank you, sir. Um, okay, then, Andy, yes. Um, I think re responsible project management, though, it's, uh, I mean, you know, really well done for pulling it out of the bag I understand that it's good it's good to save something from a crisis but res responsible project management we, we need to look at you know can, can this company deliver it and and, and that's a two-way street I understand they've signed up to something they can't deliver but also you know also us as um, pro, uh, project owners almost as, as the as sorry the asset owner we have a responsibility to hand something over to a project and understanding and being completely sure that they can deliver that and, and ultimately, that, that's why I want to see something in the recommendations that goes back to that, so that we don't have y y yourselves stressed trying to deliver something that was always going to be impossible. You know, so that's my point. Thanks, Chair. Council people. Thank you. Um, with regard to this, uh, if I may make uh, a couple of comments first, Chair, and then come to a specific question. Um, first of all, thank you for mentioning Kirsty. By chance, I have regular dealings with her, well, her uh, husband, um, and I know he'd be absolutely thrilled that she wasn't forgotten in the process. So thank you for that. Um, secondly, I, through my work with the charity, actually sat through a housing application being done um, with a person who didn't speak English as their foreign language. So with the added joy of a translator online as well, um, and working through it with the housing officer. So I actually saw it in, in front yeah. line, if you like, um, and certainly the product is impressive. And, and I, I thought, you know, if you've got to do everything where you also say, you know, and then you get uh, Slovak translation back and everything else, um, and you can still get through everything on the form and make meaningful comments, I thought it worked very well um, overall. So that was, you know, good on the product. To go back to the point about the tender, and, I, and I'm glad Councillor Cooper's understood the point you were making, which was that the tender was specific. I think there is an issue, and you've highlighted it partly, Chair. First of all, that we as a council have a housing stock. Not everyone does. So sometimes we've got to look beyond the partner that we most work with, say, Litchfield, we work with on waste, but we need to say to someone else like Canuck, hang on, you've got a stock, 
how do your applications work? And maybe we'll be ahead and therefore we'll have to do the work. Or maybe this is where the leaders board could agree in future that a joint effort would save everybody time and money. But I do think the fundamental difficulty with council um, procurement is that it's traditionally been based around the best price and the scoring of the best price. And um, one of the things that when I was in commercial environment, if somebody said to you, we can supply it to you for 50p and everybody else was asking you for 90p, you know, you said to yourself, hang on, why do they think they can do it for only 50p? What is it we're not getting? And I think the, it's the scoring of the bid that needs to be looked at. So, you know, they clearly were bidding on a basis which must have been out of line with other people's because other, otherwise they wouldn't have come in as the cheapest. So I think that's a question to go back, not necessarily about this tender would probably be a good one, but not because of this tender, but to say, are we seeing some problems where there's almost a, a, a red flashing light on this bid because it's so much lower than the others? What is it that we, they haven't worked out? So I think, Chair, it, it, taking Councillor Cooper's point, um, if we had a recommendation that said to Cabinet that we ask audit to have a look, internal audit to have a look at the tendering scoring and is it robust enough, not in the sense of, you know, has this company done this, that and the other in the past, but is there something about the, the balance between these bids that makes us concerned then, or should make us ask extra questions, then I think that would be good. And that would be to learn a general lesson without saying there was something wrong in accepting this particular bid, but in light of what we've learned since, would we be better to reevaluate it? Um, because there will always be suppliers who come in and think they can scoop the pot by going in with the lowest price and then hope that as a council we'll we'll kind of all right, okay, we'll we'll shuffle it up a bit afterwards. So if I can propose that recommendation, Chair, um, hopefully that gives voice to what Councillor Cooper was asking. Indeed. So um, let's be quite specific on what's being proposed by Councillor People, and that is that our Audit and Governance Committee take a look at our tendering process with regards to the scoring mechanisms and come back to cabinet with recommendations or findings as to any improvements that may be available to us. That's articulated what I said very well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor People. We've had that moved. Do we have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Harper, uh, those in favour? That would be a unanimous. Um, one thing I would say is you can always tell because the lips are moving. And we'll leave it at that. <laughs> it's a salesman joke. <laughs> yeah, I thought that, and then I thought, is he having a go at me? And I thought, no, he wouldn't be having a go at me. Not big, friendly Steve over there. Um, right. <clears throat> Moving back to the report, then. Chair, with regard to the recommendations that have been proposed, my only concern, and this is not directed at the officer as such, but scrutiny has the right to decide when it calls things back. Indeed. And, and therefore, a recommendation that says six months, it's really at the committee's discretion. Oh. I mean, we could ask for it next month, but so I, I'd just like that point to be yeah. taken that if we agree the recommendations, yeah. we're not fixed to the six months. No. Uh, can I refer to the officers? A response to that, please. Absolutely, come back any time. It, it was a, a um, making sure that we were coming back regularly, I think, is what the, the point behind this is. In that spirit, Chair, I've got no problem with recommend, uh, proposing the recommendations for adoption by committee. Thank you. Seconded, Councillor Ford. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I'd like to thank the officers for their time and their report. I know it's a late night for you, but thank you very much for the work you're doing. Please keep going. Great stuff. Oh, sorry. 
My apologies. Yes, the democratic thing. Um, votes, please. We've had it moved. We've had it seconded. Votes on approval of the report. Please show. Thank you very much. Moving on now to item 11, update on the asset management strategy. Uh, we have with us again uh, Marie, Councillor Marie Bailey and the Assistant Director for Assets, Paul Weston. Report has been made available uh, and I will hand over to both the portfolio holder and Paul Weston for the report. So I'm going to hand this this over to Paul, he'll go through and uh, give you an update on the asset management. What a good move. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Bailey, Chair. Uh, start off, just to make it very clear, this is an update on the asset management strategies to where we are at the moment. It's still a piece, of, it's still a work in progress. Uh, it has, a, it is a project that unfortunately has been delayed by the pandemic, uh, largely because it does, it did require access into properties you know, particularly commercially industrial properties, uh, many of which weren't actually open for business for quite a long period last year. Uh, so it did delay this, this process for us, unfortunately. Uh, so really, it's just, just by way of an update for you. It relates only to land and building assets owned by the council. Uh, it doesn't include things like plant equipment, vehicles, IT, uh, play areas, or the museum collection. So it's purely built assets. As you'll all be aware, the council owns a number of assets across the borough, uh, including land, social housing, obviously quite a large uh, portfolio. We have the operational buildings, so predominantly this building, uh, as well as sort of the tech. We have some heritage assets, ca uh, the castle, uh, town hall, assembly room sort of fits into sort of operational and heritage. We then have our investment property, which would be the commercial industrial portfolio. So those would be the town centre shops, uh, the shops on the housing estates and the various industrial units. We also have a number of uh, land uh, own ownerships where they are ground rents. So we don't actually own the buildings that sit on those properties. We, we own the ground it sits on. So a place like Ankerside would be one that probably most of you know. And also a lot of the stuff down on the Litchfield Road industrial estate. So those are included within this so far as we can uh, and again that's because of sort of the way they're sort of we only own the leasehold uh, the, the freehold interest not the the building interest there are different requirements around that and different uh, impacts for us clearly an asset management strategy needs to set out the uh, reasons for holding land and building assets uh, the key reason for that is to get the most out of those assets and you'll probably hear sort of the phrase sweating the assets used quite quite frequently uh, so that's really the purpose of this. We have had uh, a written asset management strategy in the past, but it was never actually formally adopted. It didn't go through the uh, committee process and was not adopted. But so far as possible, we've we've been ad we've adopted those sort of key principles of good asset management. As part of this piece of work to date, we commissioned some external consultants to work with us. Uh, they did a gap analysis of our existing strategy and looked to looked at the written document that we do have uh, and actually sort of looked at the sort of how that's done in practice and what's happening on the ground so it's that ground truth they've looked at really in terms of sort of that that side of it to uh, do with that gap analysis they also did the condition survey of both our housing stock uh, that was actually done in 2018 and then the commercial industrial stock and land holdings more recently uh, whilst the asset management strategy sort of sits over all of this. It's probably worth noting that we've actually been using the outcomes of the housing stock condition survey for the last couple of years as the base of our housing uh, investment programme. So that's been driving those sort of key capital programmes that you will have seen through the, uh, through the case, uh, budget setting process. So the, the key work was completed late 2021 in terms of the, the survey work. We've already had other surveys done of places such as this building uh, a couple of years ago, and that's been used as part of the work that's been done around the uh, reset and recovery. 
the survey's also been done at the castle uh, separately, and again, that's been used as part of that castle program. And we've had another piece of work done around the town hall, which is driving that piece of work. Uh, so the, you know, sort of the town, town hall uh, refurbishment project that was alluded to earlier as part of that reset and recovery, which now sits outside the reset and recovery, but's aligned with it. Uh, at the moment, the stock condition survey of both the housing and non-housing stock really only takes account of current conditions and current requirements for those properties. So it looks at where we are with those properties, what's required to keep them basically ticking over and sort of in a, a fit to let standard. It does look at things like the decent home standard on the council housing stock and again addresses those around the investment requirements. What it doesn't do is take, it, take account of any sort of future standards or any requirements around sort of achieving zero carbon. Uh, because this is really just a baseline assessment of the current condition and investment requirements. We know that going forward, there will be enhanced requirements, particularly around zero carbon. And on the housing side, we're anticipating that there will be additional requirements around things like building safety. Uh, again, you, you will have all seen that you know, there's quite a, a high agenda on building safety, particularly around high rise and high risk buildings. So it doesn't take account of any of those. The next phases for us as part of actually developing that sort of more you know, strategic approach will be to look at those implications as well. And I, I know Lynn mentioned it earlier when she was doing her piece around sort of those long term financial risks and uh, issues. They were mentioned as part of that. So they are sort of, a, sort of disseminating across that wider sort of budget setting process. The next phase of the project really will be to look at sort of addressing those issues raised within the gap analysis work and updating the strategic documents to take account of those. We do need to balance that against the resources we have available both in terms of our staffing resources and financial resources. There's a piece of work to be done around mapping the investment requirement uh, required against properties against the income received for those properties and looking at sort of whole life long term viability of those. Uh, that really then will start to lead to some models that the Asset Str Strategy Steering Group can look at sort of how, how those properties are performing and what do we consider to the, the future of those properties to be. Uh, we do have to look at that along alongside our strategic aims and objectives around not only sort of income generation, but also sort of how, how those fit in with sort of, you know, providing employment opportunities, uh, and, and sort of developing businesses in the town centre and sort of on the industrial estates. And then we need to look at those sort of the risks around what's likely to come that's going to impact on uh, sort of the asset management side of stuff. And as I say, at the moment, we can think of obvious ones such as zero carbon requirements uh, and uh, building safety. Now, zero carbon, we've already committed to as an authority on our own uh, property so where we have control over that property it doesn't extend to housing or to the commercial industrial portfolio because we don't have direct control ha over how those buildings are used but ultimately we suspect in the long term that certainly on housing the decent home standard will be ever ever changing to address uh, fuel efficiency and zero carbon and it's likely even on commercial industrial lettings the the requirements around energy efficiency and that zero carbon agenda will be strengthened and there's a likelihood that you know we won't be able to let properties if we don't achieve certain standards so those need to be factored into it as well and i think we have to accept that you know the, there may be sort of various options around the property going forward including disposal demolition and you know not holding as much property as we hold at the moment because if it's not financially viable to hold it because of the levels of investment required against the return on that investment. And that's all part of that strategic approach to it. And you know that those are the sorts of things we have to look at. We're not there yet because like I say, we only have the stock condition data. We have income data uh, sitting somewhere else. And really all those need to be brought together now into sort of, you know, an individual asset management plan, probably for each property. And on some of them, an estate based because you can't really look at individual properties in isolation on some of the estates. In terms of resources, as it stands at the moment, the stock condition survey for the housing stock 
is suggesting that we need to invest around about 128 million over the next 30 years and that's just to achieve the decent and maintain the decent home standard uh, and as I say that doesn't include any of the potential enhancements that are coming from that the non-housing stock at the moment is identifying probably around about 5.6 million over the next 30 years uh, with an income in from those investment properties of 1.6 per annum now that 5.6 million takes account of the fact that quite a few of these properties actually are on fully repairing leases where the tenant has a repairing obligation uh, there are risks associated with that of course that if the tenant goes out of business uh, and hands the keys back to us then we potentially have a property that hasn't been maintained to the level it should be and we, we end up with the sort of carrying that risk on those. So it, it's, you know, whilst 5.6 million doesn't look a lot uh, for the size of the portfolio, it's considerable considering the amount of sort of liabilities we should have. Uh, also, of course, the where it's ground rent only, so the places such as Ankerside, there's no account taken for investment in those because we don't own the buildings, we only own the land. So technically, we would have no maintenance liabilities on those. Uh, but again, there's always risks associated with them, uh, as, as Lee mentioned earlier. In developing sort of the asset management strategy, we do have to balance sort of our ability to deliver uh, with the resources that we have available to us. And again, whilst it would be easy to sort of just bring a lot more staff to, to manage that process, they might not actually generate a return on investment. So, you know, bringing in extra staff doesn't necessarily uh, generate more income for us. So there's a balance there to be had as well. Uh, the condition data around the housing property portfolio already feeds into the HRA business plan. And again, that will have been shared previously. That gets updated on a regular basis uh, because we have to have uh, a 30 year HRA business plan. So that's already included in there. The investment portfolio, so our commercial industrial stuff, will really sort of follow a similar route and it will look at sort of that longer term uh, investment requirements versus return on investment. And again, at some point, there will be some political decisions to be made because some of these properties may not show up as being viable. But politically, the decision may be that actually they provide employment opportunities or training opportunities for local residents and that we want to keep them knowing that either they only break even or they don't generate uh, surpluses for us. But that, that becomes a political rather than sort of a purely asset management uh, issue at that point. The asset management really just is there to present the facts and figures uh, and suggestions and recommendations based on a commercial commerciality basis. Uh, political decisions sit obviously with politicians. Uh, so things to, things to consider going forward future requirements around zero carbon certainly will have a financial impact on us building safety we've started work around that already so we've done some survey work on our high-rise blocks that has identified some works that are required over the coming years and cap, uh, bids have been putting the budget setting process for that but again there is a likelihood that that building safety will expand beyond the higher risk buildings at the moment they're focusing on things like high rise over 18 meters but over time that will certainly expand I, I would have thought uh, we need to look at whether the investment property we hold meets our uh, needs and whether it meets the needs of the sort of Tamworth uh, again you know at the moment we we have a few commercial units in the town centre we've got commercial unit on the housing estates and we've got industrial units tenancy rates are quite good at the moment uh, they've been sustainable for quite some time but they may not be the right property mix going forward in future so again we need to look at that one and some of that comes down to predicting the future and it's quite a difficult one uh, but you know it's it, it's watching those trends really and sort of seeing what what the trends are for businesses uh, and the obvious one for us could be that if we don't invest in our properties, then potentially they become unlettable. And then we have a lot of un unlet units, which are still going to cost us money, uh, but generate no income for us. So really sort of going forward on this one, it's the next phases for us really are to start mapping the investment requirements against income, uh, looking at the viability of those, developing those 
asset management plans on an individual property level uh, and reviewing the written policies or the written strategic document that we have in line with the gap analysis that has been done as well as the condition data that we've had now and that will feed into sort of a more strategic level document and then the asset management plans will be a more of an operational level document that sort of flags up what we think should be done to each of those properties or where we think those properties should be going uh, and then it's a discussion really sort of with members around what the view is in terms of politically aligning what we think the business case for those properties against the uh, political case for those properties. So that's where we are at the moment and like I say it is still a work in progress uh, and it's probably going to take several months of work to map those through. Uh, but like I say I think the, the, the bulk of the, the site work has been done now and that's sort of resulted in the report. Uh, there was quite a large appendices uh, that goes with this document that wasn't circulated because I think it was about 300 odd pages. Uh, it goes into a lot of detail uh, around the surveys, the, the actual investment requirements for all of the properties at, at quite a granular level. Uh, I don't know whether members would be interested in seeing that. If they are, I can certainly arrange to have it uploaded to the members' ode. Uh, but it, I think it was too big to circulate as part of a, a ca a, a, this sort of report. Uh, and it probably would have crashed all the systems if we tried to, to be honest with you. Uh, but uh, more Paul, than happy Paul, to circulate I, I, that. If I may interrupt, yeah, I would suggest that we do put that report yep. up for members to have a look at. Yeah, no, that's much. fine. I'll get that uploaded and I'll let, uh, I'll let you know when it's been uploaded then. So, yeah, we can sort that for you. Uh, so that, that's the report from me. If there's any questions, happy to take them. Thank you, Chair. Andy. Thanks, Chair. Um, so first question, why, why wasn't the asset management strategy implemented? You said that it was built, and it, but it wasn't implemented. To be honest with you, I don't know. It was something that was done a number of years ago. Uh, and I think at the time there was issues in terms of the level of resourcing that would have required to implement it in its entirety. Uh, so, like I say, it was more around sort of certain aspects of it were adopted around general practices of asset management, but as a document it wasn't. And I think this time around we do need to sort of get that balance right so that it's actually a deliverable piece of work rather than sort of being overly aspirational, uh, but not deliverable because we can't resource it properly. So not implementing the asset uh, management strategy, has this had an impact on the gap analysis that was undertaken recently? Ultimately, it will have had, although the gap analysis does sort of state, and that will be included in the document I upload, that effectively all the practice on site, you know, sort of the actual practice of asset management has been fairly good and consistent, yet there are definitely some gaps in there which we know. Uh, and some of those we will be able to fill, some actually we might have to accept they will remain as gaps in that process because of resource requirement and not being able to show return for that investment in trying to fill the gaps and I think that's the balance we've got to strike with it is that you know ultimately there's a lot of things that you could do but not all of them will actually generate more income for us or s reduce the losses to us and then you have to balance that out against, do we really want to sort of put money into some, uh, filling some of those gaps if actually they don't really show any return for us? Yeah, because yeah, oh, that's all, it's all part of asset management strategy, isn't it? Understanding, because not all assets are, are there to, to give money back. Then, you know, not all assets are in investment. Some, some assets will degrade and, and we will have to maintain and manage them to provide what they're supposed to be providing. Um, the 128 million is the, is this an inflated price due to not implementing the asset management strategy? Do you believe the 128 millions for the housing stock? That's basically uh, to deal with maintaining decent homes. So un under the decent homes, most things are given a, uh, a particular life cycle. So really, all this is addressing is replacing things as they are due to fail. So it's just the ongoing upkeep of those buildings. So kitchens, bathrooms, heating systems, windows, uh, roofing and that sort of stuff. So it's just an ongoing piece of work. So it's that th the asset management on the housing, to be honest with you, has always been around achieving and maintaining decent homes. So really that's just a continuation of that piece of work. And 
the last question, I promise. Uh, zero carbon policy, is it achievable? Noting that in your report you said that you'd have to offset some of the uh, some of the carbon, uh, zero carbon emissions elsewhere in the council in order to meet it in this area. Again, that's an ongoing piece of work. I'm not leading on that piece of work, but obviously I feed into it quite a bit because of the involvement I have around property. I think one of the issues we have is the commitment we have made so far is that we will look to achieve zero carbon within our own operations as opposed to the wider Tamworth. We don't have many buildings in our, within our control that we manage and run. Obviously, Marmion House is the biggest, which we won't have for much longer. Uh, and then our other buildings that are within our control are largely heritage assets, uh, which we know will always be a difficult one to achieve uh, zero carbon on. The depot is probably OK. Uh, again, the baseline information being collected on that one. But on its own, that would be difficult to use that to offset the carbon across our other operational property. Clearly, we'll be looking at things like vehicle fleet and that side of things as well. And I know the consultants that are working with us have probably spoken to most of the assistant directors and sort of key operational managers on it at the moment to sort of try and get some of that. And they've done all the baseline data. So I think it is going to be a difficult one to achieve across our own stock. But I don't think we've done enough work on it yet to be able to sort of say with any sort of you know definitive answer. But like I say, you only have to look at our stock to see, you know, we don't have much. And what we have got is sort of historic buildings. And I don't think we'll be clad in the castle or uh, <laughs> or anything like that anytime soon. <laughs> Councillor People. Chair, I thought I saw Councillor Hopper's hand up before mine, but I'm happy to take it in that order if you're happy. If Thank That's you, fine. gentlemen. Um, with regard to the um, assets, um, I noticed that you mentioned there's an asset strategy group. Perhaps you could tell us who's in it. That would be my first question. Yeah, the asset strategy steering group is, uh, let me just, I've got to think the names now, uh, Stefan Garner, Andrew Barrett, Rob Barnes, Lynn Pugh, Joe Goodfellow and myself, and then other people sort of sometimes are co-opted in for various aspects, so Tina Do you co-opt in the portfolio holder at all? We, we report back to the portfolio holder. Right. Right? I, I, I was assuming at some point you had to have a yeah. link with the portfolio it, it, holder. It, it is more of an operational group, a te right. technical okay. group. Um, with regard to Councillor Cooper's point about the HRA, I think it's the difference, isn't it, between the HRA where there's a legal requirement to have a plan and therefore, by definition, you have to work out your maintenance costs and your annual running costs and everything else, um, against the non-HRA properties for which you are not obliged to have a plan and therefore this council hasn't actually had one. Um, and we've got some unleftable properties in the town centre. Um, but leaving aside the, the retail, you mentioned that there's reasonable uptake of properties at the moment. And we're now promised this granular report so we can wade through it. Um, but is there a difference between the take-up of retail and commercial? Because certainly, I mean, the counts are very good, and then the food bank, um, a storage uh, unit, which is much appreciated. But I know when visiting it, I've I've seen quite a lot of units that around there that appear to be empty. So are, are there parts of our estate which, due to age and type, have you know are less lettable? than other bits of the estate which are thriving because you've, you've built a business park on one area. So you've modernised part of the industrial estate, for example. Is that the way we need to go? Or are you suggesting that there might be a bigger question like, do we need all these units because demand isn't there and maybe we should sell the land for housing? I'm, I'm asking that as a sort of, where do you think we're going? Subject to political guidance, of course. No, thank you, Councillor People. Yeah, I mean, all, ultimately, Town Centre, we have a couple of long-term empty units, uh, which we know are in very poor condition and have been for probably about the best part of 20 years now. Uh, and the, the issue with those has been the level of investment required in them. Uh, but I believe those will form part of the future High Street Fund investment process. So hopefully those will be brought back into some sort of usable condition that they, could, they can be let. The shops on the housing estates 
are largely let. Uh, I don't think there's many particularly uh, many empty properties on the housing estates. Do get a bit of a churn on those. Uh, the the small sort of uh, supermarket, you know, your, your local convenience store tends to do well. Uh, other shops such as like you know uh, beauty salons, hairdressers, a bit more churn. But again, you usually get in those properties come through. The industrial units very few vacant units on those now some of them are used for storage and that you know you may not see much activity there but they're let uh there's a number down by the depot are uh, used for like car maintenance and that side of stuff so you know you, you though there's usually a lot more activity around those because obviously there's people coming and going uh the new estate that was on our sort of what we used to call phase one uh of Tamworth industrial estates we sold that off a number of years ago and that sort of that was developed out so at the moment I mean demand for industrial units seems reasonably good uh, and has been for a while and certainly talking to sort of estate agents and sort of you know letting agents their view seems to be the same that at the moment they're still quite strong on the industrial small industrial units retail less so but again we don't have a great deal of exposure to retail in the town centre and on the housing estate, there always tends to be a demand for certain types of stores on the housing estates, and they always seem, seem to do okay, uh, just because they are convenient for local residents to, to go to. So yeah, During the pandemic, those ones seem to have been the winners, so in that sense, yeah, I can I see where you're going. Is the one on the Kerrier now let? It's still with the solicitors. Uh, that, that's what I wondered, because I was talking to the person who's supposed to have bought it, and I, I was... Yeah, I, I was in the shop and I said, "Oh, have, have you? How's your next shop going?" And they said, oh, "We're we're not in yet. We're waiting them for do work on it." So yeah. I'm just wondering it's, where we can get no, in it's, some it. It's one of those. Unfortunately, whenever you put anything into the hands of solicitors, they uh they they like to bat things between each other. But no, it's it's a work in progress. I'm no, glad Councillor Sharif people's <laughs> not here to hear you say that. I think you might have a word with you about it. Sure. But, but, but no, it's, I, it's, it's in hand. So it I, is in hand. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I have spoke, I've emailed the tenant to, or the prospective tenant today, to be honest with you. Yeah. The lease is, I think the lease is with us for signing now. So. Great. Oh, that's yeah. good to know. Yeah, so I, it is progressing. At a previous meeting, when the leader got confused which carrier we were talking which Amington one we were talking <laughs> about, he, he said that was let, and then we've it, it wasn't and then we were checking it's, so it's been agreed for a while it's just that's the legal no it's, it's fine around as i say, i was alerted to it by the um uh post office moving petition that was in the shop so that that was what yeah. i asked thank you chair that's that's i thought brought out quite a lot for us about what's where we do we've got strengths in the portfolio indeed uh, and good luck predicting the future paul because uh, my crystal ball broke a long time ago uh Gentlemen, uh, sorry, John, you, you wanted to ask a question. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, very briefly, I, I know we're getting a bit late now, but um, hundreds of years ago in my former life as a journalist when I was working for the Herald, I can remember well interviewing a councillor, a prominent councillor of the day, and we were talking about council assets and uh, what the council owned and didn't own. And I posed the question to him, what does the council own. He said, well, if you go around the town centre, look at anything that looks like it's falling down, we own it. And um, it, as you rightly said in your report, it's been a very long-held um, policy that um, doing nothing is an option. And so many of the um, shops in particular in the town have been left to fall into a dreadful state of repair. I know we're about to repair the um, the ones in Market Street, opposite the Peeled Statue, which are, which I think we were there a few weeks ago, and um, are in a shocking state. Um, that will that will help help the town, but I don't think it's a, as a policy um, we can allow that to continue because um, with our future high street fund expenditure about to be piled into the town. Um, we're looking to upgrade the town to make it look nice and pleasant and attract visitors and so forth. And to do that, we've got to encourage shopkeepers, business owners and so forth to look after their buildings, to make sure that the gutters are free of, they've got no uh, weeds and stuff. I don't know if you ever look at the weeds at the top of the shops in Tamworth, they're appalling. Um, there's more grass up there than there is in the castle grounds. It's... Uh, it's, it's a very poor, but um, we can't, with 
say to them, you know, clean up your own uh, property if we're the worst offenders. And um, I think it's a matter of priority that um, that our assets are brought into proper shape as quickly as possible and um, let. And um, as you say, we can't leave buildings empty for 20 years. That's utterly unacceptable, uh, I, I, I think. Um, one p very briefly, one particular thing: the Leafields Community Centre. I do get a, I live up that area of the town off, off the Comerford Road, and I get so many people telling me, coming up to me, "What are you going to do about the Leafields Community Centre?" Which again is something that's been falling into disrepair. It's overgrown. It's in a shocking state, and it's been like that for years. Um, have we got anything um, in line for that, or? Any is anything imminent? Imminent? Um, what can I happen with it? Thank you very much, Chair. Oh, Thank you, Chair. If you can. Don't know, Councillor Harper. Uh, I mean, first of all, town centre shops. We don't actually own many shops in the town centre, so uh, very few of them are ours. So Paul, could I ask you to put your mic on? Yeah, Tom. Yeah, no, it's a no, the red light doesn't. The red light doesn't work. I by the look of it. <laughs> so it's on on here. Uh, yeah, we d we don't own we don't own that many shops in the town centre. So clearly, yes, we know there's a there's a couple of the really bad ones are ours, uh, and those are the two that have been sort of empty for quite some time. But other than that, we don't have many empty shops in the town centre that aren't already sort of having plans attached to them. So. On, on that front, there's not a great deal we can do about sort of the properties we don't own, uh, other than th perhaps through the planning process or, or that side of things, which, to be honest with you, I don't profess to know that side of it because it's, planning's not my bag. Uh, so it's, it, it's something that, you know, it, it might be addressable through that, but they're not our units, so we can't really do a great deal with them. Uh, with the community centre, yes, we are aware of it. We've had no real interest in it. We've we've had various people talk to us about it, but most of most of those really seem to want us to run the centre, and they just want to have rooms in there. Well, quite some time ago, the decision was made that we weren't going to operate community centres ourselves. It's a site we have looked at for various options. Obviously, don't don't think it's appropriate to go in the detail because we don't have any firm plans for it. Uh, and we don't want to sort of uh, damage any potential commercial uh, interest in that one. But yeah, we are aware that something needs to happen with that one. There are discussions ongoing. Uh, and like I say, it's something that the Asset Strategy Steering Group have, have, are aware of. So nothing at the moment that I could say, yes, this is what we're doing or planning to do. Uh, but it is, it is an area for discussion because, yeah, totally agree with you. It's It's got to that point where it, it's probably not lettable anymore. Uh, but there's no real interest in it either uh, for anything that's of that size because it's quite a large unit, unfortunately, which you know makes it even less attractive potentially for that type of usage. But like I say, we'd need to look at it. Thank you. Well, I, I can put you into contact with people who would like to buy it because I get, every time I go down that area, they tell me they want it and they'll, they're desperate, well known uh, local person would that very much like to buy it, but um, whether that's desirable or not, it would need to be looked into. But uh, yes, anything that can be done to make the area a little more habitable and, and pleasant looking, because it's in a dire, dire state at the moment, and I think we ought to spend a little money cleaning it up and making the residents in that area feel a little happier about the, the place. But uh, that's all it is. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Harper, I will refer you to um, the reorganised street scene. I suggest what you do is pop a request on there and they will get a team up there, uh, prioritise it and make it look half decent for you. Okay, Councillor People. Uh, thank you. Um, Councillor Harper might also have thought about putting in a budget bid for it at the scrutiny meeting. Um, we all know the person who wants to buy it. The chief exec knows who the person who wants to buy it. He's made various representations um, to me and to other people. So um, I don't think you need to tell the council. You put him in touch with somebody. Um, and you might also want to read the previous confidential report on Solway, uh, which might enlighten you on that particular issue. 
Well, if you're aware of it, then you didn't need to ask that question. Okay, thank you. Do I have any more questions for Paul? Cancel for Richard. No, no question, just a comment. Um, in the report, it said it might not be financially viable to bring uh, some of the properties up to the environmental standard for achieving net zero. So it's more of a comment to my colleagues. There must be a moral or um, moral value that, that us as politicians can place on that rather than the council officers who obviously are working to budgets. Uh, but just a comment for my colleagues that um, we potentially need to look at that in a political sphere, uh, working out what the moral impact is of spending money to uh, bring these houses up, which will in turn help the residents of our council properties. Paul, do you, do you have a comment? Yeah, Councillor, thanks for that one. To, to be honest with you, you sort of hit, hit something there that the consultants that have been working with us have already picked up on uh, around that sort of issue of our obligations as a local authority and what what are what will be our political priority if you like uh because it was a, a conversation we had when we met with them around you know some of these things won't be affordable and will zero carbon override affordability now that's not a decision for us to make it's it ends up being a political decision uh but it ha it's, it's a conversation that's already sort of started taking place with those consultants so it's something they're aware of uh, th probably through the work they've been doing with other local authorities uh, because you're right you know it's that thing of the, there's a balance point isn't there as to what what are our obligations uh, as an authority to achieving the zero carbon and meeting our budget requirements uh, and the two might be at odds and uh, somewhere along the lines we've got to balance that through so it's, it's, it's certainly something they've got in the back of their minds as part of the process that they're looking at so I would, I, would, I would imagine that will come out through any reports they develop for us cheers thank you Paul do we have any more questions gentlemen thank you um, the report contains the following recommendations that the content of the report is noted Further discussions on the report should take place through the Asset Strategy Steering Group. The current a Asset Management Strategy should be formally updated taking into account any new data. And Asset Management Plans for individual and groups of properties should be developed. Um, can I ask, are we in favour of those uh, recommendations and do I have uh, Richard Ford have to move on block yeah yeah and Andy Cooper got his hand up second so do we need to have some kind of recommendation in around the fact that we need to see the full report being up uploaded the the the, the, the gap analysis stuff that, that, that we've been promised to be uploaded and maybe call call somebody back after we've taken stock of what's in that I, I, I think that is going to be uploaded anyway. When will it be uploaded, Paul? Can you tell me? It depends on how long uh, the web updates team take to upload it. So I'll, I'll circulate that to them tomorrow. Uh, yeah. But I don't know how long they'll take to actually put it on the system. Okay. It's quite a large document. Okay. Um, but I mean, somebody come because obviously we've got to read that and then go through that and then. In, in, indeed, but that would be for us, possibly to bring it back a future work plan. Yes. Uh, yeah. To go through. Yeah. So, again, three months, six months, how long do you want to take to read the report? Three months. Three months. So that's something to note perhaps on the next item, which is our future work plan. Council people. Uh, Chair, there's a reference in the recommendations to the current asset management plan, but in fact Paul's made it clear that we don't have, outside of the HRA, an asset management plan. So I'm a little unclear as to how we could say that the current plan will be, how there could be a recommendation about something that doesn't the, exist, I'm not the, sure. The, the recommendation reads, the current asset management strategy should be formally updated, taking into account the new data. So that suggests to me that the asset management plan that was there, is, or but wasn't adopted, is going to be looked at upgraded 
and we will be formally adopting that. Can I ask for confirmation of that, please, Paul? Yes, Chair, that's the intention. Uh, I've made reference to the asset management strategy documents that were never formally adopted. Those are the ones we're looking to update to a point where they're actually a serviceable document with the view that those would become a formally adopted through the council, uh, through the cabinet process. Council On that understanding, yeah. Chair, I'd be happy to support the proposal. Thank you very much. Uh, so, go back to the move and second. Councillor Richard Ford moved. Councillor Andy Cooper second. Can I ask for a show of hands for approval? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, at that point, Paul, I'd like to thank you, uh, Councillor Marie Bailey, for your attendance and support for the committee. Um, thank you very much. You're free to escape. Chair, is it, is it fair to mention that uh, Mr Weston's actually managed to be the last one on three consecutive uh, scrutiny committee agendas? So I think he deserves some kind of long, long service award. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm guessing... What no, I've got housing as well, so I'm looking forward <laughs> to that. But you might not be last, then. Uh, I, I'm guessing, Councillor People, he needs to have a word with Democratic Services when they sort out the agenda. It, he's been jumped a couple of times on the plea that other people were ill or had other reports or engagements. I think he's got to work on his excuses for being further up the order. Gentlemen, uh, item 12, Corporate Scrutiny Work Plan. Uh, the next meeting is proposed as the 10th of March. Potential items include, uh, and it's already on the work plan, an, an update on Solway, a new vision and corporate plan 2022 to 2025, prior to the planned cabinet decision on the 17th of March. Uh, it, that isn't on the work plan. It's potential to be included. Uh, any specific reset and recovery items ahead of the anticipated cabinet decision, 7th of April? Any questions, comments, anything else, gentlemen? Councillor People. Uh, Chair, if I may, um, first of all, you mentioned earlier on the Leaders Board paper, which I think should be on the agenda before it goes to Cabinet on the 17th. Um, and then with regard to reset and recovery, based on the question session we had the other day, um, as well as tonight, I do think maybe the uh, Marmion House options, which were alluded to again tonight as being um, dis debated and discussed and evolving. And I think as that's such a central pin to everything else, I think we should hear about it before Cabinet because I know sometimes what we collectively come up with helps to throw up some points for them to consider before making the final decision. I think that would be my suggestion, Chair. It was just to say that the Staffordshire Leaders Board item is going to Cabinet on the 17th of February, which is before our next meeting, just to clarify that. Sorry, Chair, I picked up on what you'd said earlier and I misunderstood yeah, the order. Indeed, Simon. Not a problem. Uh, I have no issue with regards to the reset and recovery, Marmion House. Leaders Board were possibly a little bit late, but it would be good to get some feedback from it going forward. I know it's being formalised. The Board is in position anyway. It meets. This is just the, the sort of setting in tablets of stone from what I understand. Um, Simon, you. I just thinking about the Marmin House one. It perhaps that comes under under ISAG more than more than corporate. I, I think I think chair. I understand the chair of ISAG's um, interest, uh, and indeed, uh, and indeed, the fact that I sit on there, it doesn't really make any odds. Um, the only thing I, I would say is that it's going to cabinet on the seventeenth, and unless that particular item is brought before us or ISAG prior to the 17th of March. That would be my concern, that what it has got to come to some scrutiny prior to that. that so it, if you normally, if um, the chair was present, I'd suggest that you um, or he and Simon sorted out between them who was going to pick it up. But if, if we've got a meeting on the 10th, 
could we agree that it's on that meeting if it hasn't been taken by ISAG beforehand? Well, let's have a quick chat. Simon, are you going to grab it? Yeah. Uh, what, what date? Um, I think the next ISAG meeting is... Joe, remind me. There's, 15th? There's one on the 16th, 16th of February, and there's another one in March, and the Reset and Recovery report is going to the 7th of April Cabinet so, meeting. So not, based on that, March. we've got plenty. So we, there is... We've we'd have, time, we'd have time have in that case. Yeah. You have a ISAG and a corporate scrutiny before the... But I think I think cabinet. ISAG will pick it up as it's. I think it's probably more more sensible to do it that way. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, on that, I will thank all the members, the officers. Joe, thank you very much for your time and attendance and your support, which is invaluable. I will now close the meeting at 17 minutes past eight. Thank you very much for your attendance and good night.